a number of people have been disappointed um, by the outcome of Copenhagen, but you've said that there are a lot of reasons for optimism in what was agreed there. Can you describe what those reasons for optimism are? It was disappointing in many ways, but we've got to recognise that in the agreement that came out at the end, the Copenhagen Accord, that agreement contains uh, a lot that really matters and is of substance. The two degrees centigrade, for example, we usually mean 50-50 chance of two degrees centigrade because there are no certainties in this area and there's lots of risk and uncertainty. Um, but that is something that would involve, and I think it was recognised, would involve very substantial cuts in emissions and is a sensible target. So out of a two degrees centigrade uh, statement, which is gen has generally been welcomed, mm you actually get specific quite quickly and then you can ask yourself the question, given the, the uh, uh, statements have been put on the table about emissions and the future emissions, which is part of the accord mm. with the January 31st deadline, and as we speak it's early February, mm. um, uh, more than 60 countries have made their submissions mm. comprising getting on for 80% mm. of world emissions. So the two degrees tells us where we should be. The Copenhagen Accord submissions promise it tells us where we're going. Mm. And so we're in a position to compare. Mm. You've described India as the, um, the genuine low carbon economy of all of the major players in the negotiations. What's the, what's the reason for that description? What is it that's happening in India that's so impressive? Describing India as low carbon economy is describing where India is now. Mm and uh, well below two tonnes per capita of CO2 equivalent per annum. Mm. China about six, Europe, Japan, 10, 11, 12, mm. United States, Australia, Canada, well over 20 tonnes mm. per capita. That's a low carbon economy yeah. in, in that very clear and objective mm. sense. Now, India is growing rapidly. Yeah. So India could become, and probably will become for a bit, a higher carbon economy, but it will still be a low carbon economy yeah. relative to the other big players. Mm. The challenge is to, as that growth takes place, to move towards a low carbon economy. Mm. And that is a challenge which India is taking on very directly and constructively. And what I'm seeing in India is really clear ideas and growing enthusiasm mm. for those ideas. Not only in government, in the centre, in state governments, also around in, in city governments and also of great interest in the private sector too. One of the concerns here is that by committing to that low carbon pathway, India is actually potentially cutting off some of the growth and development that it needs to lift the hundreds of millions of people out of poverty that are in dire poverty here. How do you um, answer those concerns? It's the right question to ask, but I think we have to see the low carbon economy as the only growth story, mm. not only in terms of reducing the dangers of climate change, which will stop growth in its tracks. Uh, that, of course, has to be part of a global mm. story, not just India. Um, but secondly, in the kinds of technological advance and creativity that will come from these change ways of doing things. So I think to see uh, this is just uh, increased cost, therefore lower output and growth, mm. is actually rather an old-fashioned short-run view. The media has had a lot of furore over the last few weeks on climate science and the, re the reliability of climate science. How do you respond to that, you know, that media um, uncertainty over how reliable climate science is? The economics, of course, is grounded in the science because this is about risk management. Mm. Managing of risks of a kind that uh, can only be described as immense. Mm. Um, if you look at the basic logic, the basic physics, it's that molecules um, with more than two atoms inhibit the passage of um, long wave uh, energy and thus that's the greenhouse effect. Mm. They catch that energy, they stop it escaping 
from uh, the Earth's at atmosphere. The underlying physics is very well founded mm. and uh, shown experimentally and shown in relation to the functioning of the atmosphere. More recently, we've been, uh, the scientific world, have been uh, engaged in modelling some of the probabilities around how big these effects would be and have been giving uh, an understanding of just how big the risks are and roughly speaking if we go on as business as usual the risk of the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere by the end of the century could be such that we would have a 50-50 chance of 5 degrees centigrade being above or below 5 degrees centigrade. Always this is a probabilistic yeah. statement these would be temperatures way, way outside the experience of Homo sapiens. And it's that basic logic which is the fundamental climate science. Mm -hmm. So does any of the kind of controversies we've been hearing touch in any serious way the main elements of that story? When you look at what I've just described, the answer is an absolutely clear no. Yeah. Should there be constant interrogation of the, China, of the, of the um, scientific evidence? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the way science moves forward. But in my view, the way these things have been written up and discussed have shown a lack of willingness of many, not of everybody, far from it, but a lack of willingness of many who are putting these things to honestly engage in the central story of risk management. It's been, in many ways, a deliberate attempt to discredit by finding uh, things which do not affect the main story and implicitly saying that they do affect mm. the main story, which is the one I've described about the magnitude of the risk from continuing under business as usual, which is founded on the basic science. Lord Stern, thank you very much. Pleasure.